Thank you. We'll uh, move on to the next presentation now. Uh, pushing rain-fed agriculture towards aridity, success and surprise in the plains of Argentina uh, by Esteban Obagi. Thanks for coming and staying until Saturday. Um, well, my presentation is going to deal with a, a spatial perspective on drought. I think so far we have seen a lot about drought coming in time, in the temporal dimension, as something that's part of our systems because of climate variability, something that may be changing because of climate change. But the perspective I want to bring is drought from the, from the view of space, as our humanity demands more food. In some areas of the world, agricultural systems are expanding. And that expansion is calling in many, many areas for drier land. So the question that I want to um, tackle today is how far can we go towards aridity with our rain-fed agricultural systems? And I have to confess, I'm an ecologist, not even a crop ecologist, but an ecologist that studies very different types of systems. So it's going to be more of a geographical and, or biogeographical perspective on agricultural systems. We are going to be mm, looking at these four points. First of all, how far so far we have been going into aridity with our rain-fed systems. And this is going to be a global analysis. Next, um, to what extent it seems a good choice to push agriculture into, into aridity? And this is a very controversial question. There are many aspects to these questions from the environmental perspective, the conservation of natural ecosystems. I will skip that and I will focus on simple ecological um, analysis, uh, the production of food, and, and finally the profit of these systems as we go into aridity. And we're going to be looking at that only in my area uh, of interest, which is the Chaco forest in Argentina. Next. For the Chaco forest and the agriculture that expands over there, I want to share with you some of the things I, I consider the most important breakthroughs for its success, its success into aridity. And finally, some of the surprises or emergent challenges that we are seeing there. When we compare uh, agricultural systems getting into aridity, it's important to constrain the giant variability of climates of the world. And I think the, the dry subtropics are particularly interesting because they show the, the effect of water more clearly as they have little limitations from the perspective of temperature. So for this analysis, we pick regions that are, that share, let me see if I can point here, yeah. So first of all, we, we constrain uh, climatic limits for the Chaco Plains in South America, which are here, and search for similar systems elsewhere. The um, mm, climatic limits that we use were a range of aridity measured as precipitation, uh, the, the ratio of precipitation to potential evapotranspiration ranging from 0.2 to 1, Rain happening in the warm season, these are monsoonal climates. Lowlands, elevation less than 1,200 meters. Flat slopes or uh, flat landscapes. And a range of mean annual temperatures that goes from 20 to 25. And there are five large regions in the world that share these conditions. The Chaco, the Mesquite Forest that's shared by the US and Mexico the Miombo Mopane area in, in the south of Africa, an area that has for a long time been cultivated, a breadbasket in Asia, which is in northern India and Pakistan, and finally, north uh, eastern Australia. Of these five regions, there are two that have the bad luck of having really low fertility soils, old geology and soils that are very poor in terms of fertility, which are uh, the Miombo Mopane area in Africa and, and the Australian region. The other three share relatively good soils, fresh sedimentary soil. So how far has agriculture gone into aridity in these different regions? Well, the graph on the 
on the left shows how these regions became cultivated with time. We start in 1700. This is based on a, on a very nice database compiled by, by the Sage Institute in Wisconsin. When we look at the India-Pakistan area, by 1950, it saturated cultivation, achieving more than 80% of the area under cultivation. The rest of the regions have been quite stable with very low cultivation, with the exception of the Chaco that is taking off after 1990. Today, this red line shows the proportion of agriculture nowadays, which is closer to 22%. So one region with high population became cultivated early on, and is actually compensating for the lack of land with a takeoff of irrigation, which I'm not showing here, that starts in the 50s and gets to its maximum today in India, Pakistan. The rest of the regions are not irrigated. This is what we see here along the um, aridity gradient from arid to humid. What proportion of the land is under cultivation, rain fed, and what proportion is under irrigation? These are the three regions that share fertile soils. So, in a way, we have a, a, a large experiment here of regions that have been pushing in different ways agriculture into similar environments. And so far, for more than uh, 300 years, in the case of India, Pakistan, some of this land has been under production successfully. How are these regions performing in terms of yields? And here we go to the, the, the point that Victor was bringing before. We don't not necessarily need to, to consider yield, but yield per year with the different strategies of double cropping that we may find. In this figure, we are comparing the yields of the few crops that are common in all regions, because this is another aspect that's interesting. Each region follow a very different pathway in terms of the choice of crops. But if we look for crops that are shared by all regions, maize and sorghum are the best choice to compare. The white bars and the gray bars there show the average yield and the variability in space for the yields of maize and sorghum. And you can see that mesquite and chaco are doing better. But if we look at the, average, the area weighted average of yields, which is the black bars there, the difference are less and even less when we consider double cropping. Calculating double cropping with statistics is tricky, and we have to use some remote sensing to understand what proportion of the land is under double cropping. When we look at double cropping, what we see is that these three regions sharing relatively similar high fertility soils are approaching relatively similar annual yields with very different approaches for that. Chaco is growing soy, soy wheat, double crop, maize and sunflower. India, Pakistan, two typical double crops, wheat millet and wheat rice, wheat rice towards the more humid areas, and a huge difference in terms of double cropping intensity. 1.2 is the intensity in the Chaco, 1.7 in India, Pakistan, one in the Mesquite. Other contrasting things, probably, uh, this convergent production, results in the compensation of different aspects of the cropping systems. Uh, India, Pakistan has been probably compensating for degradation with a high irrigation rate and high fertilization. The mesquite is fertilizing a lot, but the, Ch the Chaco area is one of the least fertilized uh, cropping, dry cropping regions of the world, and is likely compensating this with a legume, that's soy, the main crop, and soil mining for the case of phosphorus. Okay, farming into the aridity, into, into drier and drier areas seems uh, a feasible thing. And actually for a long time, the India-Pakistan region has been doing that. For our Chaco region, is this a good choice to, to farm farther into aridity? Uh, I wanna address this question from an ecological and agronomic and economic perspective and compare agriculture with the alternative land uses, which are basically pastures, or natural vegetation that's used for, for grazing or for forestry production. This is uh, the region I'm talking about, the, the western uh, plains, which 
in all this gray area are occupied by forests. The darker spots show where we are doing agriculture today. And the um, pointed line separates what's dry from what's humid. Agriculture became strong in Argentina in the Pampas. So this re uh, red circle shows about 20 million hectares where the farming systems evolved. Over the last years, these farming systems have been migrating into drier areas. Some of these uh, new red spots had agriculture before, like cotton, for example, in areas of the Chaco, but in a very small area. Now the expansion is being driven by the expansion of these humid farming systems into dry forests. So far, we have been farming 6 million hectares there, but the amount of land that's available is huge, and this is considered one of the largest uh, reserves of, of uh, cultivated land that's still not under use. So as we move into aridity from right to left in that plot, how are systems performing? And a very simple way to understand the performance of very different systems is in terms of their capacity to produce biomass, their net primary productivity. The first plot on the top shows the initial hypothesis that we had and was that as you move into aridity, in humid areas, crops are gonna be performing better than any other in cover. But as you get into drier areas, because of the different adaptations that we look for in pastures and crops, pastures are gonna do better. These are uh, perennial systems. We are no longer looking for reproductive structures, but for plain biomass. And at some point into aridity, the there's gonna be a crossover and pastures will perform better. In the case of natural, natural vegetation, on the dry end, this system should perform even better. But what we think is that in terms of food production and profit, in the gray bars there, the vertical gray bars, you may have zones where the profitability of the, of the crop system is higher even when its biomass production is lower. And this may create complications in terms of sustaining the systems. There's an incentive to go to a system that has lower productivity. Is this true? Is this happening in this gradient? Um, the answer is no. This is our compilation of biomass production or net, net primary productivity of the alternative covers. Top left, we have the three main crops, maize, soybean, and wheat. This data is based on, on yield statistics, is the actual productivity of the farming systems. On the right, you have the pastures based on, on an existing model and on data, harvest data from the pastures. And the lower left uh, panel shows the natural forest. If we summarize everything on the, lower, on the lower panel, you see that there's a high convergence for everything along the aridity gradient. This is mineral precipitation going from, five, from 400 millimeters to more than 1,000 millimeters. Everything falls in the same place with exception of maize, which doubles the productivity of all the other systems. So nothing like the crossover that we expected as far as the agriculture goes into aridity. Actually, what really matters for the productivity of the system is not so much whether we are gonna be doing agriculture or pasture, but whether we are gonna do, be doing maize or something else. And then the profit. As we uh, move towards aridity, profit goes down, but it's always higher for agriculture. Actually, there's a switch here, and the highest profit comes from the low productivity crop, which is soybean, which is higher than the high productivity crop, which is maize, which is one of the biggest challenges of this agricultural area, because there's a high incentive to sustain a crop that has relatively low biomass generation. And we will see why this has been very important in the region. In terms of the production of goods, I wanna just show this, that if we look at the 900 millimeter rainfall belt and the 500 millimeter rainfall belt, grain production drops, and we have about 55% of the production of the wet end in the dry end for maize, 57% 
for soybean, 66 for wheat. Ranching systems do worse into aridity. They drop to lower levels. Forestry drops even more in the natural system, except for charcoal that sustains a relatively good yield into aridity. The following point is to speculate what had been the main breakthroughs of agriculture that allow for this good performance all the way to 500 millimeters of rainfall. What's special about agriculture and the agricultural systems of the, the Chaco area that made them successful all the way to these levels of, of rainfall? And I would argue that there are two main things that we need to consider from the agronomic perspective. Number one is evaporation control, the control of direct evaporation. A major flux, the main competitor to transpiration in semi-arid plains. Second, the flexibility of phenologies. Both have been successfully managed by the farmers in this area. Regarding the first one, evaporation control, farming systems in the Chaco did very well thanks to the introduction of no-till in the humid mother farming system in the Pampas. No-till introduction uh, took place in 1990 in, in the plains, in the humid plains of the Pampas, and was adopted at a very fast rate by 2010, 90% of the farming systems were under no-till. No-till became adopted really fast because it allowed for double cropping with soybean, and it became even easier with the Roundup-ready soybean and later the Roundup-ready maize. This um, adaptation developed in the more humid system was critical for the expansion of the farming systems into drier areas. The other thing that's important is that Differently than other systems in, in the other uh, arid areas of the world, farmers here are arriving from a different place and are not including grazing into their management. So there's was, there was no competition with grazing and litter cover of the soil. One of the challenges that uh, evaporation control introduced was keeping a balance between soybean and maize or otherwise introducing cover crops in order to sustain a, a dense a litter layer in the system. So far, our understanding of the ET partition, evaporation transpiration partition in crops is still uh, poor, but there's an agreement that we are in the order of 100 millimeters of water saving thanks to the litter cover that we can have in the system. And I want to show you the role of litter from, from the other side of the fence, crossing to the natural forest. This is a place of 500 millimeters, the arid edge of agriculture in, in the center of Argentina. Uh, what I'm showing here is the evaporation rates within the forest and within a pasture. These are micro lysimeters located within the forest and within the pasture. And those that are in the forest have litter or no litter in our treatments. The litter amount that we have there represents the high end of litter that you can find within a forest and matches what we find in a good no-till system in the area. In the order of 8,000 kilograms of dry mass per hectare. And these are the evaporation rates that you see when the lysimeters are starting in the first day with no limitation of water. Evaporation is only limited by energy here. The main drop in evaporation rates is not by going from the pasture to the forest, but when the forest has litter. The effect of litter overwhelms the effect of canopies, controlling direct evaporation. And this is very important explaining why the control of litter cover has been so critical, changing the water balance and the funneling of water to transpiration. As you move from patches that have very low radiation 
because are covered by the canopy, and you go into patches that are in the open in, the, in this forest, evaporation goes up for those that have bare soil and remains in these very low levels for all the lysimeters that have litter cover. This may explain the very good performance of agricultural systems compared to uh, the natural systems. When you go through the growing season, having litter means that most of the time the soil is into phase one in terms of evaporation, has high humidity and, and evaporation is controlled more by energy than by, by water availability. Having water in the soil and controlling evaporation plays an important role for crops in two ways, storing water through the fallow period, but also favoring the crop in its competition with, with direct evaporation through the growing season. The second aspect I mentioned is phenological flexibility. These monsoonal semi-arid regions uh, offer a, a long growing season in terms of temperature, but the challenge of a rain season that may start late or early, depending on the year, and creates some of the biggest challenge for farmers. When we go to one of the oldest spots of agriculture, the Bandera area is the, the blue spot there. These are the different phenologies that we can find if we search for them with remote sensing, EVI, MODIS EVI. Winter crops, spring crops, double crops, winter, summer, spring, summer, and summer crops that can grow in the middle of the summer or get delayed to late summer. For this area, what we find is that from 2000 to 2014, the cropping area has been expanding. And within the cropping area, there has been a switch in phenologies. At the beginning, winter, summer double cropping was important, and it had been giving place to summer crops. And within summer crops, the late summer crops, which starts about even two months later and have a narrower growing season, are becoming more and more abundant. We look at maize. This makes a lot of sense in terms of the results that you can have by sowing later. This is a, a simulation for maize in the Madera area for 40 years. And what we are looking here is at the effect of sowing dates on yields. Depending on whether we start from a good soil water storage, intermediate water storage, or a dry soil. And it's just by looking at the 40 years and picking the third, uh, third seal that has higher moisture, intermediate moisture, and the third seal with lowest moisture. For intermediate and dry conditions, the later you sow the maize, all the way from September to January, the higher the yields that you get. Only when the profile is totally wet, makes sense to start early with the sowing. So this adaptation of moving to later sowing has been critical for including maize in the rotations. Of course, we find solutions, and solutions bring new problems. And this is true for the two things I described, evaporation control and phenological adjustment. This open niche, when the soil is wet, there's good temperature, and we shut down the system with herbicides, work for a long time, challenging farmers now with the uh, emergence of a lot of resistant weeds. That those cures are surveys by farmers showing how many uh, herbicide resistant species we have in Argentina with time. By 2004, we had the first resistant weeds, resistant to glyphosate. And by these days, we have more than 20 species that are resistant to, to glyphosate or other herbicides. If you look, there was a delay of about 10 years since the massive use of glyphosate in farming systems and the emergence of these weeds. The cost of control is going up and making unprofitable agriculture in the most marginal areas where the yields are lowest in the drier areas. This is challenge number one. Challenge number two is of a different nature and is related with our capacity to use water in a very conservative way, to have crops that reduce the, the, the amount of water that they need to uh, reach successful yields, mainly by late sowing 
and mainly by um, uh, changing the, the composition of the landscape. For those of you who work in Australia, this is something well known, and it's known dryland salinity, natural systems in semi-arid areas where you have flat rain, particularly if they are woody systems, tend to evaporate or transpire the totality of precipitation inputs. As a result of that, water tables tend to be deep and the soils store in the unsaturated zone a lot of salts. With time, with the onset of farming, this situation changes. There starts to be some deep drainage, good farmers store water in the soil, and as a result, some water escapes, pushes the salts down to the water table, and eventually the water tables get up to the surface and create water logging and salinization. 10% of the agricultural area of Australia has been lost because of this. The movie starts later in the Chaco, but it's going on. For the same area that I was showing, this is about 1 million uh, hectares in, in the Chaco. What we see is a, a very drastic change in the patterns of flooding. Until the 19s, the only flooded areas were areas where rivers go through the region coming from the Andes and going downslope into the plains. Since the late, sorry, the early 90s, we start seeing more flooding in the upper area of the region. And today, only, sorry, uh, today, paddocks that are in the high part of the region are flooding, even when there's no flooding in the river. Actually, those plots that had agriculture from the early days, the oldest agricultural plots are the first ones getting flooded and salinization is starting to compromise agriculture. To conclude, um, this issue of farming into drier areas has been um, tackled by farmers in very different ways. So far, if we look at the actual yields or the actual productivity of these three monsoonal subtropical regions, it's quite convergent. The agronomies that farmers have applied are completely different. In Asia, double cropping has been compensating for lower yields. In our system in South America, legume dominance has been compensating for extremely low fertilization rates. In the case of Argentina, pushing towards aridity, uh, our farming systems results in a relatively good performance in terms of biomass production, food outputs, and profits. This migration was based on agronomy, and there were two main genetic breakthroughs that supported it. Roundup resistance and the BT gene that uh, Victor introduced it before. It went all the way to favor the delay of the growing season of maize into later periods. It's being challenged by resistant weeds and by the hydrological problems brought by water excess. Perhaps the conclusion that I want to highlight the most is that the expansion and improvement of rain-fed agriculture into the dry calls for multiple innovation fronts. This is the lesson from looking at these regions. It's not limited just to drought tolerance in our crops. The need for genetic and management innovations that are able to sustain, sustain soil litter in these systems, control weeds in, in different ways, use deep soil water, and cope with salinity and water logging are very critical. Thanks. Is there one quick question? Yes. Thank you, Esteban. Uh, it may be not the central issue in your talk, but I was surprised by the fact that your litter control evaporation much better than canopy. And I don't know whether you can elaborate a speculation or a hypothesis of why yeah. canopy would not control evaporation at all. Yeah, canopy does control uh, evaporation, but in, in much less effectively than litter. Um, I think the, 
It has to do with the, the boundary layer and turbulence that the canopy can allow. This is a, these are forest canopies. We are exploring now uh, crop canopies, but the reduction of turbulence that you can create with litter is much more than what you create with the canopy. So the compaction, the compaction of all your biomass into a very short layer is what results in a good blocking of the evaporation. My, my, my question was more related to the comparison between the pasture and the litter. Okay. Not, not with the forest, because the pasture wouldn't have that problem with turbulence, I guess. Yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's actually a higher canopy. The, with the litter, you are compacting everything in, a, in three centimeters at, at the most, four centimeters. With the pasture,